So to start off in the next assignment where we're going to start exploring the power of Grasshopper in 3D um, in its really most dynamic fashion, um, we're going to create a bit of a saddle and then we're going to map a grid across that saddle and then we're going to start to map geometry into the spaces of that grid. So what happens to each of the individual cells when you map it across a saddle? And when I say a saddle, it's basically a hyperbolic parabola, right? You guys are familiar with that term? So if you've got, you know, something like that, and then you start to drape a surface across it, you're going to wind up with, you know, that kind of situation. And then on the other side, same thing. That's going to be a saddle um, named after form of a, a saddle a horse, right? So um, <clears throat> what happens to the individual cells when you drape it across a saddle? Anybody? Anybody? All right. What happens, what's, what's significant about each individual cell when you drape a grid across a saddle? It distorts. Or... Right. It distorts, and every single one of them is going to be entirely individualized. Right. So um, the other thing is that when you have a square cell on a saddle and you begin to distort it, because the saddle itself that I just drew is also square, but that means that it's no longer planar. Right. So that then needs to be broken and triangulated. OK, so that's something very significant to know about warped surfaces is that you can't have a four sided warped surface that's not broken into triangles if you're going to start to map two dimensional geometry into it. Does that make sense to you? Okay, so um, let's get started here. And I'm going to start off actually by beginning to create, oh, how do I want to describe it? Yes, it is running. Thank you for reminding me. Um, so I'm going to start off by creating a subdivided surface. Um, but I'm going to have to also explain to you what's really odd about subdivided surface in grasshopper, it's not named subdivided surface, it's actually called isotrim. Um, don't ask me how they came up with that name. When uh, you go to surface and utility, this one right here called isotrim, it says extract an isoparametric subset of a surface. Okay, so it essentially means that it's going to create a modifiable cell over a three-dimensional surface, right? So it gives you the, the flexibility to go into three dimensions outside of just splitting a grid. Okay, so it's kind of my basic way of, un of understanding that and explaining it. So the subdivide surface is going to ask you for a couple of things. It asks you for a surface, which is significant, um, and then it'll ask you for the domain. So this is the first time that we're really starting to play with this concept of a domain. Um, and if you you know, I don't know the dictionary definition that they put out about what the definition of a domain truly is, but the best way that I think you can describe it is by explaining it as a subset of parameters that define boundaries. Okay, so that's kind of the best way I think I can explain it. Yes? Oh, which uh, type of surface did you click on? Uh, surface, uh -huh. utility, oh, yeah. and isotrim. Okay, so let me go into here, set this up for you. Okay, um, so real quick, the reason that's so confusing, right now it's an icon and all that makes sense, you know it's called isotrim, but if I turn off that and I go to, you know, the, the title view, it says subsurface. That's why it's so confusing. So you should probably make a note of this one in particular because it's used so often that it's actually not called subsurface in the list of commands. It's called isotrim. Okay, so um, let's take a look at precisely what subdivide surface does when you create a, um, well, when you create a, a grid off of just using subdivide surface, right? Because this will actually create a surface. Um, but I want to, first kind of give it something to, to function off of, right? So I could actually model in a surface and feed it in, 
or I could generate a surface. But you know, for simplicity's sake right now, I might actually just model it in, right? So I'll show you two ways of doing this and why it's significant. Um, so let's see, I'll just go up to surface and I'll just do a corner to corner surface. And it doesn't really matter precisely how big you make it, but for, for now, we're just dropping it in and we're gonna understand it proportionally in terms of subdivisions of a minimum and maximum value. So I actually modeled that in Rhino, but you could go into Grasshopper and develop a surface right there, not have a Rhino source, and move forward. I'll show you both. Um, so to reference that surface, if you recall, you go back to the params tab and you can use you know, these empty parameter nodes. You can use the empty parameter nodes to set a reference into Rhino. So when I click on surface and I drop it in, and then I right click on that, under all of the, the um, options here, your action items here are down here at the bottom, right? As far as you know, manually overriding what its data is, set one surface, set multiple surfaces, or manage surface collection. Um, so for, for our simple exploration, we're only gonna set one surface, and we'll pick the surface in Rhino. I'm sorry, where did you get that second surface? This one? That one, yeah. So this one comes from params and geometry. Okay. The params tab, geometry, panel. All right. And then I plug that into the subsurface. But it's not complete because it needs a domain. Um, and another thing to note is that when you're working in domains, it's, it's probably only you know, half of the time that you can work with a predefined domain. Usually domains have some sort of uh, you know, programmable requirement that you have to program it, and it can't just say, I'm going to do 0 to 1. Okay. So this is kind of how this works, right? We need to uh, set a domain, and so when you go into, uh, I think it was under sets, no, where was that again? Math, that's right. So under math, um, under the domain panel, there are many, many different types of domains, and we'll go through a bunch of these actually because they're very, very integral to the way the, the program works, but the one that we're gonna work on first is construct domain or rather, I should say, construct domain squared. Because uh, the simple construct domain will only give you the output of a simple construct domain, let me drop it in, you can see it, is just a minimum and maximum value, right? One set of minimum and maximum. But, and that kind of, uh, so the input for that is just a number on one end and a, a number on the other end, and that's, that's minimum and maximum. Under construct domain squared, you have four inputs. You have a U and a V. Okay, so um, think of U and V as the three-dimensional de uh, three developable version of the X and the Y. Okay, so they're not necessarily going to be regular or 90 degrees to one another, but they will intersect perpendicular to one another. That's how they behave in three-dimensional space. Okay? Um, and I'm sure there's a more technical definition, but I'm giving you guys what you need to know um, and what I know. So this, you know, without even plugging in the numbers, we can start to plug it into the domain. And we haven't overridden anything yet, but you see that it's already speaking in a, a language that it understands because the orange went away. So it means I now have the right inputs but you're, kind of, you're still kind of missing data because right now it just says zero to one and zero to one. Uh, math domain. Okay, so um, this is the part that's gonna kind of boggle your mind I think a little bit. Even though this is subdivide surface, we're not truly subdividing anything yet, okay? Because when I go to my domain, what this is doing 
is it's setting a limit of that surface. Okay, so um, what we have to do is create a number and start it from either you know zero to one, and that would be a percentage value of zero to a hundred percent of that domain. Okay, so I'll I'll pop it in, and then you'll understand what I'm saying when I'm done with that. So um, I, for domains in particular, because it's going zero to one, I usually like to work with two decimal places. So I'll do zero is less than 0.55, less than 100. OK, and then I start plugging them in. So I'll copy, and then I'll copy this one and plug it into that. And I'll copy, plug it into this. And I'll copy and plug it into the next one. Whoops, I made it zero. Oh, I made these wrong. Sorry. I have to go back. I set it to 100. What I meant to do was to 1. My bad. 0 less than 0.55, less than 1. And you'll notice that there's an error. And that error is because all of my minimum and maximum values are coincident. And by coincident, I mean that they occur in exactly the same three-dimensional space or, you know, data metrical space, if that's even a word. But it makes sense to me, so I'm saying it is. Um, U minimum and U maximum are going to be your minimum and maximum percentage of where that edge or that first and last U or V is on that surface that we've referenced. So when I pull the U minimum down and when I pull the V minimum down, Oh, I need to hide this, actually. What are we missing? Um, oh, right. So um, when I pull these apart and uh, do one further adjustment, it actually creates a relationship of the previous surface to the new surface based on percentages. And that's called reparametrizing. Um, again, I probably couldn't explain the dictionary definition of what they mean by reparametrizing versus just parametrizing. But um, the way you get there is by right clicking on the S and going down here to your modifiers and saying it's an input modifier in this case. And it says reparametrize. OK, and you'll see a difference in your surface. And here's how that works. When I slide my U minimum, it actually slides the surface off of that edge. And if I pull it all the way over to 100, it will go all the way to the other side. So 0 and 1 will give you the maximum size of that surface. And then when you start to pull them slightly off of the ends, that's how you get inside of that panel. Questions? Oh. I'm looking <laughs> All right, back good. here. Thank Some you. people are not getting a surface. Your, your surface. So if you don't have a surface, make sure that you've turned this to reparametrize. And um, outside of that, make sure that you don't have, actually, zero should should work. I'm thinking ahead to something else. No, so. no, to be, uh, I'll come around and I'll start troubleshooting with everybody, but I'll leave this up so that you can see. Um, so generally, one of the first things to check is if you don't have any errors that are showing up, it's probably just a setting on one of your input or output um, wires, I guess you would call it. So um, one of your inputs or outputs probably just doesn't have the right flattening or the right grafting or reparametrizing, something like that. So look for those little tags next to the input and output when you're reviewing what I have up on screen. 